Hello and welcome to Video Podcast 10.1. In this podcast, I will overview ocean currents. By definition, ocean currents are huge masses of water that move from one place to another. It's very important to note that prevailing wind patterns provide the energy that drives surface currents. As those prevailing winds sweep across the surface of the ocean, friction between the wind and the ocean's surface power their movement. In the global image shown towards the bottom of this slide, you'll see that there are two types of ocean currents, namely warm currents and cold currents. The warm currents are represented by red arrows and the cold currents are represented by blue arrows. You might be wondering what we mean when we say prevailing winds. The image shown towards the top portion of this slide overviews some of the prevailing winds that we'll learn about in a future vodcast. But as an example of how winds provide the energy that drives ocean currents, let's focus on the westerlies, which occur between the latitudes of 30 degrees and 60 degrees. As their name implies, the westerlies blow from west to east, and they exist between the subtropical high pressure belt and the polar front shown in this image. So keeping in mind that the westerlies blow from west to east, let's see what's happening with the ocean currents between the latitudes of 30 degrees and 60 degrees. Let's pick on three currents relatively close to the United States, namely the North Pacific Current, the Gulf Stream, and the North Atlantic Current. All three of these currents exist predominantly between the latitudes of 30 degrees and 60 degrees. And all three of these currents move from west to east, just like the westerlies. As a second example, let's now bring our attention to the North Equatorial Current and the South Equatorial Current in the Pacific Ocean, both of which occur very close to the equator. You'll notice that both of these currents run from east to west, almost parallel to the equator. Now let's bring our attention back to the prevailing winds that are occurring near the equator. As shown in this image, the Northeast trade winds and the Southeast trade winds both move air towards the equator, and they move air from east to west. The take-home point here is that there is a striking similarity between surface current flow and the major wind belts of the world. You may have noticed that a lot of currents move in a circular pattern, and we call these large whirls of water within an ocean basin gyres. There are five main gyres that occur in Earth's oceans, namely the North Pacific Gyre, the South Pacific Gyre, the North Atlantic Gyre, the South Atlantic Gyre, and the Indian Ocean Gyre. Notice that four main currents generally exist within each gyre. As an example, if we look at the North Pacific Gyre, it consists of the California Current, the North Equatorial Current, the Kuroshio Current, and the North Pacific Current. It's also important to note that the center of each gyre coincides with the subtropics at either 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south. For this reason, gyres are sometimes called subtropical gyres. You might be wondering what happens inside of the gyres, and within the center of these circular moving current systems, there are no well-defined currents. As shown in the image, subtropical gyres in the northern hemisphere rotate clockwise, whereas subtropical gyres in the southern hemisphere rotate counterclockwise. Why do gyres flow in different directions in the two hemispheres? This phenomena can be explained by the Coriolis effect, which is a result of Earth's rotation. I'll explain the Coriolis effect in much greater detail in a future vodcast when we talk about atmospheric circulation. But for now, it's important to note that the Coriolis effect deflects surface currents to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. By the same token, you'll notice that the Coriolis effect deflects prevailing winds to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. To explain what I mean when I say deflect to the right, let's focus on the North Pacific Current. If we start at the tail of the current and draw a line to predict the straight line theoretical path, it would look something like this. But what you'll notice is the actual arrow for the North Pacific Current deflects off to the right of this line. Now let's go to the Southern Hemisphere and focus on the Peru Current. If we start at the tail once again and draw a straight line path for the current, this is where we would expect it to go. But as shown in this picture, the Peru current deflects left and travels up the western coast of South America. You might note some exceptions to these deflection rules due to the existence of land masses, but generally speaking, the Coriolis effect is what's responsible for gyres rotating in the clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere and the counterclockwise direction in the southern hemisphere. 
To conclude this video, I'd like to discuss the connection between surface currents and climate. Surface currents have significant impacts on Earth's climates. For starters, warm currents transfer heat from the low latitudes into the higher latitudes. As shown in the image on the right, the Brazil current takes warm water from near the equator and transfers it down towards Antarctica, and that movement of heat energy has a moderating effect on Earth's climates. The same can be said about the North Atlantic current, which just popped up on the screen. The North Atlantic current is basically an extension of the Gulf Stream, and it keeps Great Britain and Northern Europe much warmer than expected based on latitude. In fact, Northern Europe's latitude is fairly close to Alaska's latitude. Cold currents also have a significant impact on Earth's climates. And the influence of cold currents is most pronounced in the tropics or during the summer months in the mid-latitude regions. As an example, let's focus on two cities located just north of the Tropic of Capricorn in the Southern Hemisphere, namely Erica and Rio de Janeiro. Erica occurs on the west coast of South America, and Rio de Janeiro occurs on the east coast of South America. The Peru current, which is a cold current, runs north along the west coast of South America, whereas the Brazil current, which is a warm current, runs south along the east coast of South America. With Erica and Rio de Janeiro being at similar latitudes, we would expect them to see similar temperatures throughout the year. But as the graphs on the screen demonstrate, that's not the case. For all months of the year, Rio de Janeiro has higher average temperatures than Erica, and it's a pretty significant difference. The relatively large average annual temperature difference between these two cities is caused predominantly by ocean currents. Also worth noting is that cold currents don't just chill the air in the regions surrounding them. They're also responsible for increasing the dryness in their regions. Look at the map shown in the bottom right portion of this slide. Along most of the western coast of South America, we see deserts. And it's not a coincidence that the Peru current, which is a cold current, runs along most of the western coast of South America. The arid conditions seen along the west coast of South America occur because cool air resists vertical displacement. In other words, cool air doesn't want to move upwards and higher into our atmosphere. Because of this fact, cloud formation and precipitation is minimized along the east coast of South America. I'd like to briefly provide one more example of how surface currents impact Earth's climates. Let's focus on the California current, which is a cold water current that affects much of the west coast of the United States. If you ever get a chance to travel to Northern California, you'll notice that the temperatures generally stay pretty cool throughout the year. And these cooler than expected average temperatures in Northern California are due to the cold water California current. If we focus on the average annual temperature plot for Eureka, California, we see that the average winter temperatures hover right around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but the average summer temperatures don't get much higher than 55 degrees. Now look at New York City, which occurs at a similar latitude. In New York City, the summer temperatures get really hot and the winter temperatures get really cold. The huge difference between the blue plot and the red plot we see for average annual temperatures in these two cities can be explained by the westerlies, which are the prevailing winds that affect most of the continental United States. On the west coast, the westerlies bring air from off of the ocean onto land. And because the ocean temperatures don't vary much throughout the year, the temperatures in Eureka, California won't vary much either. However, in New York, those westerly winds blow across the continental United States to bring air to that region. In the summer months, land heats up very rapidly, and in the winter months, land gets really cold. Be sure you avoid the misconception that the Gulf Stream is what's responsible for making New York's temperatures warmer in the summer. While the Gulf Stream is a warm water current, the westerlies actually push the Gulf Stream off to the east. So the Gulf Stream's effect on climates in the eastern United States is far less than its effects on climates in northern Europe. Okay, that concludes this video podcast. In our next podcast, I will talk about upwelling and deep ocean circulation.